Good afternoon. Call our uh, work session to order. It's good to uh, see everyone back on this nice spring day outside. I think we have a pretty packed agenda, but one I think we should get through uh, fairly quickly and on time and be able to uh, proceed and enjoy the rest of the day. So then to go ahead and get started, the first thing we have is uh, our superintendent's report. Uh, so. Dr. Boone, I, that's in your court. Good afternoon, Mr. Jordan, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen. As we uh, committed to the board earlier this year, as we think about our educational planning work and when we look at how our facilities utilization and our capacity given our decline in enrollment, um, the board last June extended its contract or continued its contract uh, with the Dijon Richter now Cooperative Strategies Group. And as a part of that work, we've been <coughs> engaged in several conversations about how do we approach the opportunities that we have before us. Additionally, uh, Tracy Richter was with the board, I think, mm, a couple months ago, a few months ago, doing an update as we were dealing with addressing the enrollment piece as part of our budgeting process. So today, Tracy Richter is here to do a process update uh, on the planning process of where we are and some next steps in the timeline and, and going forward. So uh, with that, I turn it over to, to Tracy Richter. Thank you. Um, is it okay you want me to go up there? I'm going yeah, up there. Probably back you know, yeah. you I'm going to leave that behind because I can see that. Well, good afternoon. Um, of course, always good to be back. Uh, I do have an update for you. I've, I'm going to take you through a process today of, of looking at enrollment projections, but I want to go over enrollment projections to show you some indicators of why we're doing some things we're going to be doing um, and understanding you know, why things are happening beyond um, what may be perception out there. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit, just give you an overview of another component that's going to be added in the planning piece, which I'm really excited about and doing some facility condition analysis stuff. Um, talk about our middle school utilization and some strategies that we're working on. Just uh, briefly overview that stakeholder engagement that we're going to begin in May. Um, I start with projected enrollment by looking at birth rates. Um, and I think this is important because um, as, we, as we look at declining enrollment, um, and, you know, in Norfolk, but I will tell you, even across the urban landscape, across the country, um, this, this decline of birth rate is having a pretty large impact on decline enrollment. I think that there is perception out there of, you know, underperformance or they're the urban schools, so we're not going there and just go down the list of every excuse you've ever heard of why we have decline enrollment in urban schools. But when we start to look at it, something as simple as a demographic um, a demographic influence, there is a direct correlation to what we're going to be seeing here. And what I want to do is kind of take you through that pathway of, of why you see some of the charts you see. So if we look back a little bit, we, you know, we saw in the last 10 years a peak enrollment being that 2007 class, okay? So a, a birth year. Well, that class right now is your fourth grade class, okay? And so understand they probably, they were going to enter into your school about 2012. That makes sense, a five year, your birth to kindergarten. We all know that that, so as we, as we look at this big chart here that I, sh that I put on here that I fully don't expect everybody to read all this, but what this is is our cohort survival map, okay? What this shows is a progression of year to year survival ratio of birth to kindergarten, birth to one, and then your survival ratios as you go grade to grade. Obviously, what we'd like to see is every single one of those being 100% or greater, so you see growth in there. But the one to focus in on when we're talking about, as we're looking at the projected enrollment, is, is this next chart, which is that circled red. I just blew it up for you, okay? Now, the reason I blew this up is because if you look at the birth to kindergarten ratio there, with the exception of the 2013, which is an anomaly year, which could have to do with Head Start, it could have to do with, I mean, there could have been a parochial or private school that might have discontinued for a year or something happened. But if you look at the consistency of birth to kindergarten rates across the board, which is what you see is in that low 70th percentile. So, and this is a, this is a birth rate of where students are born, 
Okay, so it's a place of birth. So we track by mother's address. And so we know that, in, and it's never one-to-one -one also, that we, a, a child that's born here doesn't always show up here, but there's also students that aren't born here that show up here. So it's never one-to-one. -one. But why we track the consistency of 10 years is to show you that you can expect to your birth rate about seven out of 10 children that are born here are gonna show up here. And it's a pretty standard rate that you're going to get. Now, can things influence that? Absolutely. But what we've seen in your trend and, and any sort of trend out there is that we're not gonna see huge deviations from that. But in case we do see that, we're always tracking even birth to first. We wanna kinda of see if there's any consistency there. And guess what? You still see some consistencies there um, as you go across there. And you know, so that all being said, that declining birth rate has a huge impact on that entry level kindergarten. And so if we look then historically at the historical enrollment that you see, you see that kindergarten of 2012, that 3026, well guess what? That's your 2007 birth right there. That so that 2012 kindergarten, that, thir that 3026 students, you see that's your highest enrollment in the last 10 years. There's a direct correlation to that highest birth rate of 2007. And because of your consistent survival ratio from birth to kindergarten and going across, you're going to see that continued decline. Now, so with the anticipated 400 less births in this year's data that we see, or the, in, the late, in, the, in, in the 2012 data, <laughs> those children are going to show up in kindergarten this year. That 2012 birth is going to show up in the 2017 birth in a kindergarten. So with 400 less students at 71 or 72 percent consistent rate, you can expect that there are going to be less kids just due to a demographic factor, not because of anything you ever did in a school building, not because of any facility condition, not because of any sort of demographic movement in your city. It is just a simple demographic shift. Okay, so, and I think that has to be clear out there. I think we have to help people understand that we're going to see leveling off of birth rates because we are probably linked to more economic conditions than anything. You guys have a Navy influence that a lot of cities don't have. And so maybe there's influx there or some decline there, but that seems to balance itself out. And, and the Navy is a really good communicator with you to know those trends and, and to make sure you, there's a great partnership there. So. Um, so, but I don't expect that we're going to see any major either blips or increases that we can see yet. Um, now, there's all kinds of things that happen in City Hall that we're not sure about or what they're going to do yet either. So we just have to stay in communication with them to see whether there's any gentrification possibilities or redevelopment or whatever is going to happen. We have to keep up with that. So if we look at the projected enrollment, and I look out at this projected enrollment, um, what I'm, and this is the reason why I go through this, is that as I look at that 6-8 line at the bottom, and follow me on that 6-8 line. Yeah, next, the grade 6-8 through eight on the bottom of the chart. Next page. Yeah. So you can see that even though we're, we see a utilization issue at the middle grades level, and we know that, and we'll get that to the next chart, but, but what we can see is a real stable enrollment at the middle grades. Because remember, the biggest class that you have is a fourth grade right now. And that fourth grade class is going to take a few years to push out of that middle grade's education world. Okay? Now, here's what, here's what the concern will be. Is that if you look, go four years out, and then the next five years after that, if the demographic holds and the survival ratio holds and the consistency, you, should, you could expect a 600 student drop in five years at middle grades. So these ebbs and flows of enrollment and how they pressure our buildings and how, but in our current state, how do you react to that? Now, not that we're going to talk about high schools, but let's talk about high schools a minute. Because if we really think proactively and we think, okay, if it's four years down the road, well then we're going to see four years of a big enrollment in high schools that we're going to have to live with. 
but understanding the next four years, you are likely to see a three or 400 student drop at the high schools so as to not overbuild or to consolidate too quickly in seats that you may need later or in time. And so as we start to look at these enrollment trends, and we've gotten a lot smarter in the last couple of years as a group when we're looking at these things, we want to pay specific attention to decisions that we make for either reduction of seats or increasing of seats where we need them for a certain time, but being able to reallocate those seats when necessary. And our building should handle some flexibility like that. And so I think that it was important <coughs> as we were talking that I go through this enrollment just like this to help understand why, why we make some decisions that we are going to be making and you're going to be seeing fairly quickly as to, you know, when you guys start seeing maps and you start seeing lines, you know, we don't want you freaking out. We, we want you guys fully prepared for why we make some of these decisions. And enrollment is going to have a lot to do with it. No question. And so um, are there any questions on that enrollment piece that you see? Can I, is that okay if I stop, to take that break right there? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, please. So on the, um, I guess the last chart. Turn your mic on. Oh, on the last chart that we uh, looked at, the so we see about a seven, if I'm reading this correctly, about a 7,000 student gap between K-5 and 6-8. Is that correct? K-5 and 6-8, yeah. Okay. And we know uh, historically we've seen that drop, but is there is there anything that you've determined thus far that causes that, or is that kind of typical of what you see across the board in divisions like ours, what? So let me jump back really quick to that survival ratio table for you, if I may. I may go back to the bigger one. Um, <coughs> and even though that's hard to see from, from out there, but if you go to that chart right there, you know, typically what you're going to see is you're going to see between that fifth and sixth grade, you are, you are likely to see one of the lowest survival ratios from that. Okay, so what happens at the sixth grade level is that this is where, I, and nothing's typical, but this is where the typical drop happens. This is where, you know, parents aren't comfortable with middle grades education in, or if it's a middle school or if it's a K-8, it may make a difference, but, you know, look, parents fear middle school, and they do, and there's, and, and there's no reason to for all you watching out there. There's no reason if you're in middle school, but there's a real decision to make at that point. And so what you see is either, you can see in some districts where there could be an exodus, but you know, in, in cities that have an urban core that have suburban rings, what you see is a sixth grade bump, typically. You see kind of that going to the middle schools in the suburb areas or that next tier level schools. And so you will see in those, in those core urban centers, you will see that decline. Now, also because there are clear parochial choices and you know, other choices like that that cities can offer that other towns can't offer, you see that too. Um, but if you look at the eight to nine, now this, is, this one's really important because it's, I, cause I know you guys, you're gonna dig into this, Matt, and you're gonna ask questions about this later. So if you look at that eight to nine, you see those 125, 130, 145, you're not having more kids show up. But, so this is what you gotta do. You have to look at the eighth grade to the 10th grade. Because here's what starts to happen, is that as students get into high school, if they don't have enough credits to be considered what we might consider a sophomore, we still consider them a freshman in that, in that October count, because they don't have the credit hours to get there. But in the next count, because they typically then get their sophomore credit by the end of their, their sophomore year, then we see that catch up. And so what you see is then this, this kind of slingshot back to this 70, 65 percent. And so that ninth grade is kind of a, is, is a weird data set that has to be explained a lot. Um, because what you're doing is you're counting a certain sector of, but what this can show you oftentimes in your survival ratio from eight to nine is what's happening at the ninth grade. What's going on at the ninth grade that we're having years that we get, you know, 145 percent 
are, you know, is there something going on that we aren't getting our freshmen to their sophomore credit hours? Or So what it does is it informs our academic team to say, hey, look at these survival ratios. And that one year where we had 126, you know, that's actually a pretty good year. I mean, you're always going to get a group of students who aren't going to have enough credits. Whether it's a gym credit or something like that, they're still going to miss one. But if you could target that freshman year to be in that 120 range, you are in really good shape in your high school because then the survival ratio stays, which is, to me, if you, if you look, the, the, the real trend shows that the lower that survival ratio, ratio at 8 to 9, the more you're going to keep kids going all the way through high school. And so it's a critical year. So that can help influence, again, some grade configuration decisions, some transition decisions, some, and how we do planning like that. And so I don't see anything that's really atypical. Um, obviously, I think the goal we should look to is how do, we, how do we grade progress to make sure that we get those numbers to 100%, <coughs> not 97 or 98, which are still good numbers. But you know, for every 100 kids we get, we lose two. When you have this many students, those twos add up. And we can't have that. So our goal should be to get those numbers to that close to that 100. I guess my follow-up would be, is there anything that we should do or may accidentally do that would um, change the, the gap that we're seeing right now um, going into middle school? Well, I think there's, there's a couple things you could do. I mean, I think that you can look at, you can look at grade configuration possibilities. You can explore the idea of, are, are middle grades better in a 7-8 scenario, in a K-8 scenario? A, you can explore those. Those are definite ways to try to attract kids to stay into middle school grades. Um, but again, that's a huge curriculum decision. That's in, and so I think that is one approach. Um, I also think that, I also think that as we look at this next approach, I think a cleaner feeder pattern is going to, will change that. I think that as you still look at today's boundaries and some of those elementary, and you know, two years ago when we, almost three years ago now, when we showed a direct feeder pattern and we showed improvements in diversity at schools, we reduced some hyperpoverty, reduced that, but we had to do that by adjusting some of the elementary boundaries to be full feeders into their middle grades programs. We still have today in areas 10, 15% of schools that split to another school and to split to another middle school that have no social continuity and, and in turn could lack program continuity because they're going to a completely different environment that, and it's very difficult for that principal to communicate with all those schools at the middle school level and to build that collaboration between middle grade leadership and elementary leadership. So I think clean feeder patterns should be the first step because I think that is, if done right, that's a low pain. You're not, you're not necessarily changing, you're changing the boundary of the middle school, but as you enter sixth grade, you never knew that middle school anyway. So it's, it's, it's almost, it's not completely painless, but it's less painful than changing elementary bounds right in the middle, mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you got that. So I think that's gonna be our first approach because I think we can get those survival ratios up by doing that. And, and let me also reflect too, I know it looks like a precipitous drop when we go from 14,000 students to 6,000, but remember, it's secondary, so when you combine, you're somewhere, you're starting out 13, almost 13,000 students. So we, 13, 14,000 students when you, you look at, um, if you look at 2017, 18, and the six recommended district-wide projected enrollment, the bottom of that chart, 6,200 students and 7,600 students. So we're very close to carrying 14,000 secondary students, and we carry 14, almost $15,000 dollars. <laughs> Tell budget is on budget. my mind. You're in budget. <laughs> 15,000 elementary students, and so because of that, I think we have to go up to the top portion of that chart and look at the actual projected grade level enrollment. For example, if you look at 1718, we projected enrollment of 2351 fifth graders. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at 1819, <coughs> we're at 2284. 
So that chart, while the numbers look like we're going from 14 to 6 or 14, 13 to 5, there is, there is a difference, but it, we don't lose 6,000 kids. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, so ideally, in, in, a, in a strong feeder pattern, obviously with six grades to three grades, you'd just like it to be 50%. So if I have 14,000, I'd like 7,000. But we know you're going to lose some kids there. So I think that you, you work towards those goals of balancing. And then, then you've got, of course, the four grades at high school. So trying to balance and trying to maintain the same, the same number in that cohort throughout the system will be important. Um, and again, that comes through retention, but it comes through retention by, you know, great articulation of pathways, and, and not just programmatic pathways, but grade level pathways and, and neighborhood pathways. And so combining all those will make a difference. Yeah. And, and again, as you know, we, 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 we really pay attention to those, the, the balance and equity in, this, in the socioeconomic sense. One of, the, one of the board goals that has been established since we started planning the way we have was doing that. And again, we are working toward middle school feeder to do just that, to help alleviate some of the hyper poverty areas. Um, obviously, in a district that has an 80% free and reduced lunch, you're gonna, you, you haven't got a whole lot of leeway in that. But you can do it, and there's great pathways to do it. Um, I was in a, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I walked two schools a day, and I'm excited about what's going on in your buildings. I mean, I am really excited. And then it was a direct feeder pathway. And I can see why there's progress happening. Um, and so by, by knowing those kids know when they get in kindergarten, they know where they're going. And they know where they're going, but they also have choices out there too. That is such a comfort to families to know that. And we'll keep them here if they know where they're going. And so I think that, again, that's why I wanted to hit this projected enrollment and, and hit it pretty hard because I think it's a big driver for us in what we do. So if you look at the, any more, Mr. Jordan? Is that okay? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. okay. So we show you the maps because, you know, we're map crazy, but um, just to show you some of the trends that are happening. Again, we can look at the enrollment numbers all we want. I'm more focused on trend. I want to make sure that I'm obviously concerned as your planner looking at how many seats we're going to have to have serving kids. But I also want to see the trends and look across the, the, look across the division to see where I can expect some growth in that projection because remember, we do live in projections also. Dennis does a great job on the attempt projections and projecting the enrollment out there. But when we start to focus on where kids live and those projections out there, we want to see some areas of growth and decline, and then that will also help us articulate cleaner feeders and how we do that articulation. Um, and obviously, we can dig a lot deeper into some of the data of the students. Well, and obviously, this will relate over to the middle schools then because of those feeder patterns. Um, and then we haven't shown the high school here, but the high school is going to show basically the same kind of trend out there. Um, so you see these areas of decline. You see the areas that are pretty stable out there, and you see some growth areas still. Now, again, this is how we see it in today's world with the permit information we have, with the birth data we have, you know, with the, with the communications with the city planning department that we have. This is how we see this. Um, but this is why we do this every year, is to make sure that we're, we're capturing the trends that are going out there. So if I look at the middle school data summary, though, this is where the, the key focus starts to become. Um, is looking at this middle school utilization to see where we are. Lake Taylor becomes our focus because Lake Taylor has a huge impact from the K-8 at Camp Estella. Um, yes? Right. No, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You projected live in mm -hmm. enrollment change. Is that, um, okay. so we're talking, if it's a darker color, then you have a greater than 10% increase mm -hmm. in the live-in enrollment. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, now again, <coughs> you've seen live attend charts that we do. We always take into consideration that you're going to have transfers across boundaries. And, we, and we're always going to have to consider those. Um, but again, we always, but the pathway of this from the beginning is, is that investment into that neighborhood school and the school that's in their backyard to see if we can, not that transferring across the boundary is a bad thing. We don't, again, we don't put judgment on that. But what we want to make sure is that that neighborhood school is a choice. That it's not that if I don't get the choice school, I don't have a choice. The neighborhood is your choice. And then you can choose selections based on your abilities. That's, that's where we're trying to, that's where we drive to. Um, so that live in is important for us. And again, this is where, this is why we do this one every year is because 
the city can do things that we that are beyond our control, and we want to watch that. We want to, and not that they're, and, and I don't say that in a negative connotation. I mean that in that, you know, they're always approving permit information. They're always looking at redevelopment and gentrification of parts of the city. Um, they look at, you know, demolition across the city. So we want to pay attention to that because that really can impact what we do, um, and and how this map can look. And, but I mean, I think again, we we are so in depth in the data now that we can make that sharp turn when we need to. If something happens, we can make the sharp turn and relay that information to you very quickly at this point. And that helps us tremendously. But I think, it, again, it relates back to this capacity that we have in our schools and making sure that we're going to have enough capacity to handle these bubbles and then have not have too much in times of decline where the maintenance is too overwhelming and we get behind and having spending operating dollars on empty seats, because we don't want to do that. So in, in this case, I've highlighted Taylor, in, because I want you to show you, this is a, a and you Lake see Taylor. this. Lake Taylor. Lake Taylor, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lake Taylor. <laughs> and if we, as I, I was looking at the numbers more, and I was, I was talking ahead of myself. Um, so if we look at Lake Taylor, um, this is a chart that, um, that Dennis puts together to show you the comparison of the attend projection versus the live projection. So where you see the DJR down there, that's our live projection. The top line is the attend projection. And so there's a, there's a clear delineation there. Now, line is the attend. does that make sense? The top line is the attend. Top line's attend, and bottom the line is live. So either one, we're going to see now, because if you relate it back to the map, <coughs> You know, if we lay, relate back to the map, we do see some growth in the area, in the live-in, but you know, not enough to impact kind of the utilization of that building, and and what we see um, for Lake Taylor compared to the to that. So, on top of that, just knowing the impact of um, of where the feeder is going to come from, and Campus Stella students that will feed the Campus Stella six eight instead of the Lake Taylor. We're, we're obviously going to show some, we're all obviously going to hit some impact there, okay? So what we have to focus on when it comes to utilization solutions is first of all to look at realigning those elementary school feeder patterns and best, how to best utilize those seats in the feeder patterns. Um, maybe to look at, and again, we, we just can't stop at Lake Taylor. I mean, you look just down the street to maybe one of your best condition buildings called Ruffner and we're finding that it's just in continuous decline and mostly because of an aging enrollment in that area that we don't see a lot of movement out of the, out of the housing in that area and so that the families actually stay there while those, even when their kids go. So you've got that factor happening. Plus, you know, in, in the urban center, the just population drops and so, and you've got a school here that's not around a major population source anymore. Yes. It looks like the projected live-in enrollment for Ruffner, for instance, is greater than 10%. Mm -hmm. And then based on what you just explained, I guess I'm trying to balance because mm -hmm. we've seen declining enrollment there. Right. And so on the, on the middle grades, remember on the middle school projection especially, mm -hmm. we've got this little bubble. So everybody's going to experience that little growth right now. Okay. But you're already at a building that has very low utilization. Right. So if we look a little further on, and which I want to look at, yeah. is to say that, so you're going to see that right now, uh -huh. that'll change colors quickly, like in the next couple of years. We'll see the five-year projection uh -huh. drop off again. Okay. For so, projected living. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we won't have a choice. Okay. We just won't even have the kids there. Yeah. And again, I think we were actually talking about this today. I would really like to see some, some statistics on, um, on the turnover of housing in certain sectors of the city to see the longevity of housing. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of analysis in a lot of districts that talks about, you know, housing <coughs> turnover and ownership and those kind of things. But I'd like to see kind of that longevity. And we can, you know, it's, what's nice now is that we've got enough data to track by student ID to see if we can track them by their address over a long period of time. And so I, it's the next piece of data that I'm really eager to get my hands into because I think that that's going to help us shape some of that to know that in some of these areas, we may be having um, housing stability of people staying in their homes 
long after their child has left that grade level. Mm -hmm. And so how does that impact what's going on? Because we can see that, you know, if, even if we've got population increase, we may see that that doesn't increase children because of just how long they stay in their homes or where they live. And so I'm, I, what's nice is that I think we have that data, and I've, I've already pinged Lee on that to say, hey, let's start looking at some of that. Because I think especially in, in the Princess Anne and Tidewater and, that, and all that corridor, we have to pay some special attention to this um, to kind of see what's happening in here. Um, and because it's my guess that what we're seeing is just longer stays right now. Um, and, you know, I think in the, last, in the last seven years in particular, we have seen a real stability. I think we're starting to see some movement in housing again. We're starting to see some transients occur again. But the last seven years, we have not seen that. We have seen a real stable, you know, non-movement, you know, housing rates aren't, you know, big startups aren't there. We don't see movement around. People are staying in their homes. They're cautious about what's going to happen. Um, but I'm kind of curious to see what's going to start to happen again. Um, yeah. On the middle school mm -hmm. data summary, you have Lake Taylor with an asterisk one, Rosemont with two. Where are those footnotes? Those, and, and I should have taken those off. Those are referring to something on the bottom of this chart that, um, and I, Dennis, do you remember what those reference were? Well, Rosemont is um, a In 10, is a choice school. Is a choice so school, yeah. When you look at the John Richter's numbers, Rosemont and schools that do not have attendance zone do not show up. They show where the students live. Right. So that's why there's an asterisk and, there. And I believe Lake Taylor's was flagged as a one because of the, <coughs> the uh, Southside STEM Academy that's, becoming K-8, and that's a transition school. Because of that. I, I pulled this one. I think you already have this sheet somewhere in some data point. I, I pulled this specifically out to look at these. Because, like, you do see Rosemont, we don't do a live in. Right. Because you can't. Right. Um, so, but what, at, I think in, in the combination of what you're going to see is that as we explore the focus on utilization solutions, especially at the middle grades level, that the three of these are going to come into play in some way, shape, or form. Now, consolidation of schools may not mean complete consolidation of putting two schools, but it may mean some consolidation of enrollment somewhere mm -hmm. and trying to balance that so we get our feeder patterns cleaner. And so trying to figure out um, you know, what that means, but I think there's opportunity for us to make sure we utilize our buildings better um, in this case. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm not sure that we're going to get to an overall solution on Ruffner yet. I'm just gonna kind of just give you some preamble on that. I think there's some unpredictability there that may take a little time. We, I mean, maybe by the end of summer we'll know something better. I don't know that answer, but I have. A, but we need to make sure that we're because there's all kinds of there's all kinds of great ideas floating about Ruffner. Awesome ideas that I'd, I'd I'd love to share, but I'm afraid that we'll get down rabbit holes that we're we don't need to get I'll down. The the but there are all kinds of great possibilities for a school just like Ruffner, yeah. um, and but. One dynamic will affect another dynamic that will affect another dynamic. So I'm not sure we'll have the overall solution for Ruffner yet. Um, we will definitely have a, a, a solution for Lake Taylor. And, and also, we're definitely going to have a solution for feeder patterns for you in this, in, this, in this update, yeah. Just to go piggyback on the question Ms. Bassine asked earlier. So in, on the chart where you showed the projected live-in enrollment change <laughs> to that map. Mm -hmm. So I, I was following because the Ruffner middle school map overlapped the previous map where it showed the growth. On the north side, for the, where you have north side middle school growth, I thought, it, I thought all of those were uh, in decline. So can you just explain again why and you show that growth? Say that again in the... Then on, <clears throat> excuse me, on the map where you were showing the uh, the growth. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, the change. The, the I, north, you know what? It's the change. So it's that's, change. That's why it's not I, growth. I realized I reread it. It's, it's not an increase. Yeah. It's a change. It's a change. The, yeah. Sorry about that. I should have said that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a change, change. I either. It. I, a, I caught it. Ten percent or better increase mm -hmm. in enrollment, or it could be a ten percent or greater decrease or decline in enrollment. Okay. So it's about to change the change. The the little it's not key. necessarily an increase. Okay. That's right. Okay. It's a change. You know, and I'll talk to Lee about recoding that for you. Yeah, I think okay. it's a good idea because I don't want there to be confusion about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, 
so that kind of gives you a preview of, of how we're going to approach that. I think the next piece to this is that what I'm really excited about is that um, you are engaging a firm to do a facility condition assessment on a certain amount of your buildings. Um, I'm excited because this is a group that we've worked with in the Chesapeake Bay area for almost 10 years now. And, um, and this group is a group that we do work across the state with. And so we're very familiar with their processes, with their data. Um, we're actually even personal friends, so that's really good news. Not that it has any connection with what you guys have done, but we have a, such a good relationship with this firm that we finish each other's sentences now. And so their data is going to feed our data perfectly. Now what we have is an opportunity to align not only program, demographic, now we have a condition component to add in to the mix of decision making and prioritization, which is a huge component to this to know that there are buildings that we shouldn't be investing in because we know that it's not worth investing in that building. It's better to spend dollars in better places or to replace or do something like that. That's what this study is about. Now, they're going to be limited in their study to start, which is a budgetary constraint that everybody deals with, but that's fine. Um, they've gone through an identification process of looking at this and um, to identify those buildings. I've, I've had some input on that. to kind of direct them in some areas that I've noticed that we have to, that we know we're going to make some decisions on. Um, but at the end of the day, the goal is to create a facilities condition index, which is a measure of renovation versus replacement um, that looks at the systems analysis. And they're also going to do a, just a spot review of our capacity that we did in 2013, um, just to make sure that everything's on. I did a couple schools today just to do that too. Um, and so we're going to align that all that condition data now in with our demographic information, our program information, because one of the things that they'll do, even though they, they might not even be tasked to do it, but I know this group, they're going to look at the educational adequacy within the building. They're going to look at space types and they're going to look at that as they're doing the assessment. And they're going to let me know, hey, you know what, we may need science improvements here, we may need technology improvements or whatever it is. And so um, that's going to help us align some of that programmatic things that we have. So I can't tell you how excited I am that you guys have done this um, because I think this is a big step in, in just more validation of the need of the division. Yeah. I'm aware that they're going to look at the educational aspects and they're going to look at maintenance versus replacement. Um, we have a huge flooding problem here in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. And so are they also taking into consideration rising sea level? So I will ask him that. Um, obviously, they'll look at, they have they have asked for all of our data too and we have floodplain information and so it's in their data set um i will talk specifically to him about that to Thank make you. sure that there's any indicator there but i will i will specifically talk to him but he has that layer because we have that layer okay and are they looking at all of our facilities k-12 to so including all of our high schools as well they are looking at some of the the schools um, I'm looking to, to Rhonda and Steve just to see. It says 10 to 15 schools. So I believe in that information that was provided to the board a while back that, to, well, to, to the uh, committee, that there were, we looked at, we, we had a, a facilities assessment report through 2018, 2017, 2020, I'm sorry, 2020. And so we're re reviewing that information. So high schools are probably part of that, along with some of our, what we identified as the other 10 schools that, that had some significant facility needs. They, they will do, um, to follow up on that, they'll do an evaluation of the MGT study and, and look to see any sort of improvement that were made on that study, but what has not been done either. Um, to see if they can, so they'll try to update as much as they can. It's a 10-year-old study, so I mean, I think there's going to be some, uh, probably some real estimates in there. But again, I have, I have full confidence in the firm that you hired that they're going to give you a pretty good picture of this, for this. What, what we've discussed is they're going to discuss, they're going to identify the top 10 schools within the whole division to, to review as the 10 most challenged schools. Okay. And then they're going to identify those on, on based upon the, the parameters that um, you talked about, Trace talked about. Yes, sir. In the, uh, some of the original data that you gave us, you looked at capacity, uh, 
with portables as classrooms and with portable and without portables as classrooms. Mm -hmm. What are, what are you doing now? I mean, is, are we looking at? And I'm looking at you too, Dr. Boone. Are we looking at trying to minimize the number of portables act serving as classrooms through this? We are. I mean, I think part of it will be that. Yeah. Um, they'll look at those portables for condition, but it's my guess that very few will pass, frankly. I mean. We, right, we have some portable needs. But <laughs> as we think about the, the issues related to um, building capacity, and you look at those numbers of where we may be in terms of enrollment, I suspect in, in some of the cases we may be able to see utilization move away from that because of the overall enrollment for that. So that's our hope. The, the nice part about this is that they're not only going to look at your need, but they will project out. I mean, they're going to look at your, your systems and your buildings, and they're going to project out life anticipation. And so, and, and you do that in a couple ways. You look at age. Obviously, every system has a best practice age, but they'll also look at the maintenance and condition of that. Um, yeah, I was in, I was in uh, Lake Taylor today, um, and you have boilers in there that will last another 100 years. They were built so well. I mean, so, but age sometimes doesn't matter when they've been well maintained or they're, or they're good quality product. And so, again, you bring that experience in to know that they can give you anticipated life also to let you anticipate some of those needs. It's a great tool. And Tracy, you also mentioned that you know, we certainly need to know what the city is planning to do mm -hmm. with areas in the community. Are you all sitting down with them this summer, Dr. Boone and Tracy, to understand what planning is doing? We're actually in regular conversation with them. Um, and as things are coming out, we, you know, we're being informed. Right. So we're hoping to learn some more in the next week or two mm -hmm. yep. in terms of what some of the city's thoughts are. Yeah, that's critical. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, oh, we, yeah, definitely. And one of the things we had talked about, uh, you know, during this budget discussion was yeah also at the policy level yes looking at it, you know we've also uh, extended an invitation to uh, the housing authority and others to also look at that at a policy level so we have that opportunity as well and I actually working on a meeting with the housing authority probably if it's not the end of this week early next week in dialogue with the Planning Commission would right be, mm -hmm. uh, Piggyback right off of that. Yeah, and the ongoing meetings that that uh, my team and I have with the city, city's leadership, uh, the acting city manager, and, and that team is also the place where we are having these discussions about what is what's going on in the city that could impact school enrollment. So, so the last piece is just the steering committee engagement. Um, we have kind of re-engaged the list. Um, Dr. Boone has a kind of re-engaged list on that that she'll share, she'll share with you also. The intent to get to, you know, we, our goal is to give you a, a strong deliverable in October, give you some time to plan into the budget year into even any sort of action that can happen in the 2018-19 school year. Um, but in that time, meeting with, again, re-engaging that steering committee, it, making sure they're reviewing data too. They're a great communication piece. They're an eye on it from the, from the community standpoint. Um, this has been a great group in the past. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back with, we're gonna have some new members on there, we hope, and, but we're gonna have some core members that kind of stuck it out with us the entire way the last time. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, we anticipate in the fall sharing information with the community much like we have in the past, going out to schools and having community engagement to make sure people are aware that we're doing this. Um, it, it works well. I think we get good buy-in on this. Um, and as we get more and more people that are engaged in this, our meetings become bigger. And so I'm excited to be able to go back out and strategically go around the city to make sure we're informing people about some of the things that we're looking at. Um, yeah. Just a question, uh, just to refresh my memory. Um, who makes up this, the uh, steering committee? Well, last time we, they've provided me information. Of, it was a combination of school staff, uh, city, city um, representatives, school board, community leaders at large, parents, high, um, I think there was someone from higher education, a number of entities. So it is my intent to work with the board because 
certain we can navigate certain things we want to make sure we have the military as part of it because of our our commitment to what we're doing i want to have a discussion with the board probably at this next meeting to think about or prior to that next meeting to think about uh how you would want to approach the parent and community participation on this because i think it is with the board's focus on community engagement and the way in which you've handled the advisory councils I was thinking it would be a, a really good opportunity for the board to vet folks to serve on this group. Yeah, I think if I recall, we, we put out a call and asked people who were willing to serve and tried to make sure it had geographical diversity and right. all of that. Yeah. And, and our so advisory forth. councils is, as well, mm -hmm. representation. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody what? I'm sorry, Tanya. Advisory. Representation from our advisory councils, oh, okay. CIAC and GIAC. Right, and okay. Well, groups. and yeah. at, that's true, but I, I would ask us when we get ready to have that conversation to allow to think more broadly than that because those are parents that are involved at some point already in the district. How do we bring some other parents to the table? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Tracy, to reiterate, you said we're going to do the community involvement engagement in the fall mm -hmm. to water drip some of the ideas we have before we come out with a final recommendation in October. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So you'll be getting the pulse back from the community that will, you will build into the recommendation? We will. Yes, that's the intent. Good. It was hugely informative in our last kind of couple rounds right, for exactly. us. exactly. Yeah, and it, it allowed us to navigate some things and, and frankly not to take some hills we didn't need to take at the time because the community said this is something maybe we shouldn't, we're not ready for. So I thought it was really good. And then finally just an update on the, on the process <coughs> of where we are. Um, you know everything and you say you've seen this one too making sure that there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes that kind of go into this um, you know this this elementary utilization we're not going to lose sight of that either um, we need to make sure we're paying attention to that but balancing in the condition that we're going to do also um, you know what are going to be our pre-kindergarten goals out there as we look at space that we're going to be using or not using in time does pre-k come into play on that that's going to be a huge one for us um, I think that's another one that can stabilize or grow survival ratios. Um, we all know that. I think it's a it's something that we need to pay attention to. That's going to be so dependent on funding, though. Um, this neighborhood choice follow-up. I mean, I I really don't want to lose this. I want to figure out how we can continue to engage this idea that students have the pathways of neighborhood or another program, and I really want to keep focus on how do we do that well. Um, because I think that can be, I just think that that offers a great ability to, to step in front of 99% of districts in this nation. That choice really is about neighborhood and then opportunities for you beyond your neighborhood. Where choices become, if I, and across this country, choices become this idea that if I don't get it, I'm going to fail. No, that's not an acceptable way of choice. That's not choice. We want to, I, I still, this may be my banner to carry. And if I have to carry it, I'm gonna, I will continue to carry it in this one um, because I think this could be great for the city. Um, the overall condition review will be in there. You're gonna see, start to see that. Hopefully he'll start walking pretty soon. Um, I'm eager for that data. Um, we're always gonna be looking at the socioeconomic balance and then obviously the steering committee follow-up that Dr. Boone's gonna have with you. Um, we're, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, so, so you know that. Um, I know you don't get to see me very often, but. Either we're WebExing or I'm here, so we're doing one thing or another behind the scenes. So I appreciate your time today, or, and I got more questions. And if, if I could just make a comment before the questions. I, I said it the last time that Tracy was here, but what a pleasure to be able to engage in the types of very deep conversations that we have to, w with the team and to, to go back and forth around ideas and, and the real substance and the deep dive into data kind of work I like to do. So uh, I, I appreciate the work that we're doing with Tracy and his team. Tracy, when you um, are looking at your board recommendations by fall 2017, and I'm going to just hone in on the pre-K okay. that you had just mentioned, um, is it your goal to strategically look at pre-K so that we can increase what enrollment we have in the live-in area? Um, because right now, through Norfolk Public Schools, our pre-K is for students who qualify for a very um, certain number of um, qualifications. Uh, I know that the board um, has, has thought about the idea of mixed income pre-K. 
And so strategically, if we're going to use that as an option to help build our live, and I might not be saying this right, live-in ratios or survival ratios, sure. is that something that you are looking at when you say pre-K options? I'll let you start and then I'll the, Right. right. The, the pre-K options initially is about capacity to serve pre-K in existing buildings versus the two center-based programs that, that we have. Mm -hmm. We know Willoughby will become a full center pre-K center once grades three through five enroll <coughs> in Ocean View in the fall. What you are asking is, is that uh, deeper philosophical question around whether or not we should move in that direction. And that, you know, I've heard the, the board you know, have discussions on that. I think one of the things we have to do in that, we can certainly say where would we have space available for pre-K classes. But because most of our elementary schools are, with the exception of a couple, are at or slightly above capacity, we don't have excess capacity, even with the small schools. A school like St. Helena, who, whose capacity is around 295, 200, 300 students, they're enrolling 276 students currently. And so there's not that we have a lot of excess capacity in our elementary schools. That's part of a programmatic conversation that we'll need to have in terms of direction by the board and how we would approach that. It, it makes a great deal of sense, but this work is really about the students that we have and how do we uh, manage our capacity with students we have and those we project into management. And I think this is a secondary conversation to this. Okay. We can certainly say what space is available, what it would look like to, in order to accommodate that. But I don't, I, my scope of the work with this had not been about how do we make that happen in this particular phase. Okay. So when you see that projection across, you're gonna see a flat line projection. You're gonna see a straight projection. We don't project pre-K enrollment because it's so dependent on policy and funding. Right. So, and that's so even though, and that's exactly how I said, we will look for the opportunities <coughs> based on board policy and direction mm -hmm. and be able to create some options based on space mm -hmm. if, there's, if there's space there. But so it may run, in, so you may see in that, so I don't want that projection to be confusing. It doesn't mean that there, we don't aspire for growth in pre-K, or we right. do. There's no judgment on that. It's just we don't know. Right. My second um, question was when we did um, one of the first phases of the original um, plans that you had outlined when we split schools to K2 and 3-5, we also had some transition of some of our special education classes. Um, and so are, are we going to be taking into consideration um, those students with significant special needs where placement is going to be ideal for them I, and I guess also building capacity so when we're going to when the what we do look at when we're doing those kind of those those sliver adjustments and those feeder adjustments we are making sure it's it's for instance it's one of the reasons when I was at Lake Taylor today I was looking at special ed space I was looking to make sure that and we also have the data on it mm -hmm. so we're not going to if we have that issue we're either gonna gonna have to make an adjustment to the facility to accommodate it or figure out the service delivery model and right. so I think we're informed by it but it's definitely part of the conversation we have because it affects our capacity tremendously right and elevators and elevators and elevators is a big one <laughs> so, so <laughs> elevators is a big one and uh, yeah, and no you're doubt. aware yeah. from the facilities committee that the elevator is in a planning phase yeah. mm -hmm. there, there is a placeholder for an elevator at Lake Taylor Middle. We kind of put a pause on it, mm -hmm. but it hadn't left the table, right. as well as Laramore. Right. Kind of as a follow-up to that, are we also looking at CSEP and where that's located throughout the division? No. Okay. And, and let, me, let me, the reason I say no, sorry to jump on that, Tracy, is we, we, we certain, similar to, to um, Dr. Gabriel's question about where classrooms are placed. We know oftentimes our more self-contained classes tend to have landed where there was space, not necessarily where their feeder pattern is. So this will give us an opportunity to see where the students coming from that are in classes that may be outside of what would have tr traditionally been their home zone feeder. <coughs> but we also have to be able to have some efficiency in that. 
and therefore we can't necessarily serve students in their home feeder if there are only three students. Mm -hmm. So that, that becomes one of those efficiency pieces. And as student enrollment shifts, that class may work this year for the next three years in that building, but three years from now, it might need to be in another part of the city. So we, we take all of that into consideration. For CSAP, that has been about available space in buildings at the level of the, the grade levels of the students being served. We effect, essentially provide the classroom space. CSEP runs the program. So in terms of making decisions, we certainly, if there's any school that we're examining that has a CSEP classroom in it, we will engage in that conversation with, with CSEP executive director and his team to, to talk about is this the place where it will, will remain. But in terms of looking for anything else for CSEP, that's not our goal. The, I know there's the one year commitment to CSEP that's, uh, excuse me, housed in the Richard Bowling, the old Richard Bowling School. That work is ongoing. That's separate and apart from this. Okay. So we're looking at a different solution for that? Yes, we've been working on that solution for almost a year now. Okay, gotcha. The great part about our internal group is that about every department's represented in that group. And so, They'll, they catch things like that, the programmatic things that, that we don't want to step on the toe of. Right. Um, so the dynamic of this group that we, and it's a little different that, that I'm going to have to compliment Dr. Boom on this because one of the different parts of this process is this internal group that we've gathered of idea creation and the departments in there to check us mm -hmm. on those very things. Mm -hmm. The room is very dynamic. It's actually a lot of fun to be in for three or four hours. Um, I, I call it fun, I don't know why, but work should be fun, but this group is awesome when it comes to that. So we check those things. They'll say, no, we've got special other, or no, we've got something there. So it's, so they're checking us as we go. It's a good checks and balance group. All right, anything else for Mr. Richter? Thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure to always have pleasure you come to and present to us and uh, Faded Division, you know, rest with you and Dr. Boone. So. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> we All bring right. the vision, you bring the action. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dr. anything else under uh, superintendent's report that you have for us at this time? No, I don't. Okay. So then uh, we will proceed uh, to academic affairs. Um, today's uh, topic for academic affairs deals with textbook adoption, primarily history and social studies. Dr. Rogers is, is coming to the podium and will be supported by other members of the team. Dr. Yes. Rogers. Good afternoon, Mr. Jordan, school board members, Dr. Boone, cabinet, excuse me, not cabinet, DLT, division <laughs> leadership team. I'm excited to bring forth to you this afternoon in conjunction with some of our academic affairs team members, particularly Bruce Brady, who is our senior coordinator of history and social sciences and who was also supported by Tricia Burdecka, who is one of our teacher specialists. In, her, in absence, um, Jennifer Lopez has also assisted in this effort. As you know, periodically we go through what's referred to uh, from the state as an instructional materials review. In our case, we call it a textbook adoption. And right now, it, we are heavily in the process, or actually rounding up the process, of doing the textbook adoption review for our history and social sciences. So what you'll see or and hear today from Mr. Brady is an overview of the process that they've undertaken this school year. They began in late fall back in November <coughs> and they'll share with you a timeline as well as some considerations that were presented to all the stakeholders that were involved in this very intensive process. They gathered input from many stakeholders throughout the city, as well as parents, community members, as well as business partners. They will share with you the priorities that they considered with regards to the textbook adoption. And finally, they will share with you the recommendations for your consideration. So without further ado, I will ask Mr. Brady to come up and share the recommendations that he and his team have presented. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Jordan, and Dr. Boone, and members of the school board. Um, our recommendation of history and social studies textbooks this afternoon is the culmination 
uh, six months of a tremendous amount of work by a lot of people, Norfolk uh, staff, uh, community members, uh, partnerships with um, those folks with the uh, textbook uh, publishing companies. Uh, we have evaluated over uh, 120 different titles uh, as a part of this textbook adoption. And uh, I uh, completely uh, feel and have uh, the utmost confidence in uh, the textbooks that, that we'll be recommending to you uh, for adoption. The, um, the selection of uh, textbooks plays a critical role in supporting um, classroom instruction, supporting our teachers and our students uh, as we uh, increase uh, academic achievement for all students and uh, work towards ensuring uh, full accreditation. So these textbooks play a very important role in, in that process of instruction and achievement. The Constitution of Virginia uh, gives the authority to the State Board of Education uh, to approve textbooks and instructional materials uh, for Virginia's public schools. And the Code of Virginia also um, states that local school boards may adopt textbooks that are not on the board approved list, provided the school board selects such books in accordance with regulations that are put into effect by the board. Our own uh, Norfolk Public Schools policy also uh, deals with the selection of textbooks and acknowledges that the state board uh, provides a list of textbooks. Um, uh, but again, the last sentence in that first bullet uh, that states local boards may adopt books which are not on the state adopted list provided the selection is in accordance with the specified guidelines. And that next bullet lays out those guidelines as to uh, who should be involved in the committees and in the evaluation of the textbooks. Now, um, although the State Board of Education adopted new standards for history and social science in 2015, they adopted a new curricular framework in 2016 <coughs> and new standards were to be implemented this coming fall. Um, we were uh, told uh, the state announced in March uh, of this year what their timeline was for um, uh, adopting textbooks and coming up with a state list. We had already started our process uh, knowing that the new standards were, go, were to go into effect and we originally saw a, a parallel adoption taking place as the state was doing their work and we would be doing our work and we'd all end at the same time and, and uh, see where we were all at. But the state now has a timeline that doesn't have them providing a list of recommended textbooks until at the earliest spring of next year uh, in March is what they're shooting for. And we had already started our process. Um, and in, in considering the fact that, you know, they're not going to have <coughs> textbooks out until next year, uh, our uh, contracts with publishers expired this school year. It was the end of, of the seven-year contracts from the previous adoption. Uh, knowing that we're going to move forward with implementation of, of the new standards uh, in the fall. Um, knowing that we need instructional materials in the classrooms uh, that are going to uh, contain the new content uh, from the new standards that are going to address the new and more rigorous essential skills of the standards um, that will address the uh, huge reorganization of content, K3. They moved entire subjects, topics from one grade level to another. Um, 
in a way that makes a lot of sense in the organization, but a lot of that material was moved. And so we're left with K3 textbooks that do not any longer match the, uh, the state standards and, and what the curricular framework uh, um, has. Um, also, moving forward with inquiry and skill-based instruction, uh, incorporating new technology that's available uh, with the social studies textbooks. You know, the last adoption was, I believe, in 2010. And there's been a tremendous uh, amount of, of new technology that's available and provided in support of, of uh, instruction in a classroom that, uh, that we just simply don't have right now. I don't think any of our secondary textbooks uh, currently have an online component or available online um, that, that just, just didn't uh, exist uh, during the last, uh, the last adoption. And so we're looking forward to being able to, to provide that. So our adoption, uh, the timeline, uh, as Dr. Rogers said, started last fall with each building principal identifying a teacher to serve on the committee. The publishers were contacted uh, by January. The textbooks were rolling into the schools. Uh, in February, we had a night where the publishers came in met with the committee members and were able to uh, provide uh, all of the features uh, of their textbooks uh, to the committee members. The evaluations uh, continued uh, throughout the spring um, and we're here today to, uh, uh, to bring you that list of recommended textbooks. A little bit about the evaluation process. Although each um, building had a uh, teacher on the textbook committee, um, all of the teachers were involved in the evaluation process. So every grade level teacher in the elementary school had access to the books and were encouraged to um, uh, evaluate them and, and provide us with that feedback, uh, as well as all of the secondary social studies teachers. Uh, so the actual evaluation wasn't uh, restricted uh, to only those members of the committee. It was opened up to all teachers who uh, in any way are involved with social studies instruction. The evaluation process uh, really involved two stages. Um, the first stage uh, was aligning those books, correlating those textbooks <coughs> to the state standards. Uh, and going through those textbooks and finding evidence of each standard in the textbook that was uh, being evaluated. And so that correlation uh, provided 50% of the score for the textbook. And then the second phase of the evaluation would then be conducted by a teacher taking a look at the content of the textbook as it aligned to the framework, the organization, the technology, physical characteristics uh, of that textbook. We also involved the community uh, as well in the evaluation process. From January the 23rd to March the 1st, the textbooks were on display in five of uh, the public libraries. Uh, the Norfolk uh, Schools website uh, announced that uh, display and that the community uh, was welcome to uh, participate in the evaluation um, the, uh, and, and could uh, submit uh, evaluation forms uh, to us. Um, we had elementary textbooks at two of uh, the libraries. Uh, grades 6 to 12 were at uh, two other of the branches and then the whole group K-12 plus advanced placement uh, were on display at the Slover. Um, and the libraries were tremendous uh, to work with. They uh, accommodated us. They gave us uh, great space. Uh, and in the Slover, we had a wonderful location. We were right on the first floor near the elevators. You know, you really, I uh, don't think, could, could get very far into the Slover without uh, seeing the, the display of textbooks there. 
So the public uh, had the opportunity to uh, review uh, textbooks and give us feedback. They were able to do so uh, both uh, electronically uh, or uh, through a paper evaluation. Um, the evaluation forms that we did uh, receive were very uh, positive uh, in uh, their recognition of different features of, of the textbooks. Um, noticing the, the layouts, the, the, uh, the visuals, uh, the vocabulary work. I uh, was very impressed with those features that were, were highlighted uh, uh, by uh, the public that submitted the, uh, the recommendations. Um, there was some, a few comments uh, about the lack of internet uh, being addressed and also uh, some comments about the textbook publishers themselves and, and their power uh, in the education system. Uh, but all of the <coughs> textbooks that are being recommended uh, without exception had uh, excellent uh, comments and, and reviews by the public. So it was nice to see that the public comments really uh, meshed with the recommendations that were coming uh, from our schools and, and from our teachers. Um, the textbook publishers also to uh, make sure that we're getting uh, quality products uh, that are free of mistakes uh, have provided us with certifications um, that their textbooks uh, have been reviewed by at least three content experts and we have the credentials of those experts. Uh, they have certified that their textbooks are free from any factual or editing errors, and that those textbooks have also been reviewed for typographical errors. Uh, in moving forward, we'll also be um, working in, in partnership with the publishing companies to provide professional development for our teachers in the use of those textbooks in the use of the technology, the online components, uh, so that our teachers will be able to provide effective instruction uh, with using uh, the new textbooks. And right now, a lot of our social studies teachers aren't familiar at all with, with those types of capabilities that uh, the textbooks and, and the publishing companies are able to provide. So we will have uh, PD scheduled for uh, August throughout the school year, and those companies will come in uh, throughout the year and work with schools, with grade levels, with individual teachers, uh, whoever needs that assistance. Uh, they'll be coming back in future years to work with new teachers and providing professional development for, uh, for the life of the contract. Uh, they'll be there to assist us. Uh, depending on uh, funding availability, uh, our, oh, let's go back. Um, our, we've, we've set some priorities uh, for purchasing, and we'll get as far through um, the list as we can uh, with the funding that is available. But uh, K-5 is the first priority because of that content shift that has taken place. Uh, two of our elementary books uh, as well were consumables um, and the contracts up. And so there are no new textbooks coming for, for those two grades. Uh, and so we'll be taking care of elementary uh, uh, right away. Um, next in the priority is, uh, is both our uh, AP US history and our AP European history. The College Board redesigned both of those courses and we need to get the new redesigned textbook uh, into those classrooms to support those students uh, in both of those AP courses. Um, and then we'll proceed through middle school and uh, into uh, the high schools uh, with, with uh, their selected textbooks. All right, and so the textbooks that are being recommended to you uh, for adoption, um, these are the elementary titles Five uh, of those, um, K through three and fifth grade, are from Five Ponds Press. And the fourth grade textbook, uh, that is the one consumable uh, of all the textbooks, uh, K-12. Um, 
but that textbook will be for a new course we're putting into fourth grade, uh, giving students a, an overview of U.S. history before they go into Virginia studies to study Virginia's role in those events in American history. Um, we felt students were going into Virginia studies and, and studying Virginia's role in the American Revolution. They hadn't studied the American Revolution yet. Um, and so we want to give them that background so in the following year they can dive deeper and, and, and have a more narrow focus on, on Virginia's role in, in those historical events. Uh, moving into uh, middle school, uh, both U.S. history courses, part one and two, um, we're recommending the McGraw-Hill uh, textbooks for those. Uh, Five Ponds Press is the recommended uh, textbook for the civics and economics. And then our world geography that uh, students take for uh, high school credit uh, in middle school, um, we're recommending the Cengage uh, textbook. Uh, Cengage is also, uh, was interesting that both the middle school world geography teachers <coughs> and the high school world geography teachers uh, both selected the same textbook uh, for, for that. So, yeah, worked out well. Um, yeah, um, Cengage also uh, is the recommended textbook for World History uh, One. Uh, Pearson for World History II. Uh, the U.S. History, uh, back to McGraw-Hill. And then Pearson, uh, again, for the uh, uh, U.S. Government class. Our electives for psychology, sociology, and our African-American history course, um, uh, HMH, and uh, two McGraw-Hill textbooks. And then finally, our advanced placement courses. Those six courses, um, a variety of publishers, from Pearson, Cengage, McGraw-Hill, uh, also Bedford, uh, Freeman, Worth for two of our AP books. Um, and again, we'll be uh, trying to provide that AP European and AP US uh, history textbooks uh, immediately uh, they're high on, on the priority list uh, for those classes. All right, and so that's an overview of, of the process and the uh, results. And if you have any questions. I think Dr. I certainly want to thank uh, Mr. Brady and all members of the social studies team and, and the teachers for participating in this process. This is one of the most important responsibilities that, that teachers and others and content specialists have, making sure we have the, the, the proper alignment of the resources. And I would say social studies is probably the most difficult uh, content to do adoptions for because to the, to the public comment that said the power of, of textbook publishers, we are in a large state. And therefore, textbook publishers try to work with standards in mass so that they don't have to redo everything. And every state has its own history and its own set of uh, thinking around what should be taught and when it should be taught. And so the challenges of finding textbooks that are more closely aligned or most closely aligned to the state standards and expectations is really uh, a very rigorous process in a state like Virginia where we aren't New York, Illinois, or Texas that pretty much drives the standards that, that um, support uh, textbook adoption. So again, it, it, please don't um, underestimate what it took to, to go through a social studies adoption because the standards are, are so different from state to state. Math, we can, we can find agreement. We may not agree on the books. So, you know, we know which theories, which practice, principles we should be there. But social studies is always the one, too, that's subject to social studies and sometimes science. So much of the controversy around what we teach, how we teach. And so I'm pleased, uh, very pleased, with the process and the outcome of this particular adoption. So thank you. Thank you. 
questions? Comments? Dr. Gaber? I just wanted to review with you again the Virginia SOL time frame for the, the rollout. So the standards were adopted March <coughs> 2015. Yes. And then, um, and then that curriculum was kind of pushed out to teachers and content leaders to review it. When are we technically going to be tested on that material? All right, well, there's been a lot coming from the VDOE uh, regarding history and social science. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot we don't know yet. Uh, what we do know is that the VDOE uh, told us in January that there will be no new tests created on the 2015 standards. Okay. And so we were all ready to jump into the new standards. We had spent several years preparing and we were ready to launch the new standards, the new tests and, and tackle all of that next mm -hmm. year. So the state says there won't be any new tests created for the 2015 standards and next year you're going to continue to test in all the currently tested courses, but you're going to use the old 2008 mm -hmm. uh, tests. Right. Okay. I just wanted to. That's as well as the push for, again, more local developed assessments. So we're going to have an accountability for results around history and social science. Yes. Right. Um, it's just Wednesday, so I'll be nice. It's, um, <laughs> I got a lot of week left to go. <laughs> the true definition of an unfunded mandate. We know the content is important, and so going through the process of aligning your textbooks to the standards and curriculum frameworks is exactly what we should be doing and unpacking for our local curriculum. But the mandate that we have to generate our own assessments as part of an accountability system is an unfunded mandate. So the state gets to tout the fact, and it, it, those of us who were at the VSBA uh, Tidewater meeting on Monday, we hear the state superintendent talk about how many <coughs> assessments we're moving away from. The state has moved away from the assessments. The local districts have been burdened with the responsibility to provide the assessments. And so, as, as Mr. Brady was saying, you get excited and you're ready to roll, we think we got this going on. And there's, there's a cog in the wheel in terms of, one, what do we have ready when we, based on the assessments? Two, what's the value added of assessments that aren't aligned with the current standards? And then three, what's the ongoing work that we're gonna have to do to make sure we validate that we have assessments that are rigorous enough to say that our students are, are uh, mastering the content in the social studies? Mm -hmm. we, we currently give performance-based assessments in the courses that the test, uh, the tests were eliminated in several years mm -hmm. ago, grade three, uh, US one and US two in middle mm -hmm. school currently have performance-based assessments. Mm -hmm. um, so this, the state said, well, we're gonna keep you in a transition year next year. Uh, we're still gonna test 2008, but you need to start creating performance-based assessments for all subjects. Mm -hmm. for I don't know. If all means all <laughs> subjects, uh, K, I mean, th this could be a massive undertaking right. that, that we may have to uh, begin if implementation of, of PBAs is, is what they're looking for across the board, so. So I just wanna clarify, we're not, we're not adopting books just because <coughs> the standards of, tr of 2015 are are there with the increase in the on uh, the, the technology piece and the uh, the fact that they've shifted some subject area around? We're we are adopting the books because a it's time to adopt the books and b because we want our kids to get this new content and delivery of the material. And and that is. Your, your uh, assessment is correct. That's why we're adopting. But also, the timing of the revision of the standards is also linked to the timing of renewal for textbooks. That's what and it looks so, like too. So, right. So, right, exactly. If the standards weren't shifting and the, the content seemed to still be applicable in the textbooks mm -hmm. we had, 
we could recommend staying with the same mm -hmm. companies. Um, but because the standards have shifted, and unless, it, you know, the textbook is, it, the teacher is what drives how well we deliver on the curriculum. The textbook is a resource. And so we need to make sure that the resource that we have for teachers and students is the, the best resource aligned to the curriculum expectations and the standards. Okay. Thank we aren't you. driving it for the test, I guess, is what we would say on, to, to the other piece, the, the one question, one item that you didn't include in that list. That we was, aren't buying textbooks that was for subliminal. the test. <laughs> no, right. I got to make it overt. Yeah. We aren't buying textbooks <laughs> yeah. for, for the test because obviously we're assessing on 2008. Right. We're buying it in terms of the standards and what our students should be able to know and demonstrate. And so we're aligning resources to that. The assessment piece is a separate piece because the state has one set of assessments for those that they are administering, and then the performance-based assessments and what is happening at local districts mm -hmm. and all of that work is, is a secondary piece. Mm -hmm. So for us, we, the standards and the curriculum focus is driving this. Are we disadvantaging any of our children by using new textbooks on old tests? No, and we're, we are uh, specifically addressing that. question. Um, there, there's a lot of good about the new standards. Uh, the rigor is there. Uh, the uh, skills have been, uh, have a, uh, a large amount, of, the rigor has increased there as well. The, the new standards are much better organized. But we're not testing to the new standard, that's the thing. No, but in our new curriculum that we are rolling out also this fall, um, we are accounting for any content that uh, may have disappeared in 2015. We're maintaining that content in our curriculum okay. as long as uh, grade levels are still going to have to take an SOL. And, and we don't know, this, the state hasn't said beyond next year what's going to happen. Right. Um, but, but nothing is, is being left out. Anything that is uh, testable, will still be addressed, yes, absolutely. And will you be teaching it through these new textbooks or do you have to provide a separate workbook that's not even in these textbooks? Uh, no, the new textbooks will Have will the address. content. Yes, yes. Usually that common piece is, is something that's accepted nationally in, in the standards. Where we align to teach it, it may be the difference. And so fortunately, when we find that agreement within the standards, even from 2008 to 15, then we can use a textbook that gets us to that point. Right. Dr. Gabriel, were you finished? I wasn't finished, but Courtney asked the question, one of the questions that I was going to ask. The, my last one was, you had mentioned funding priorities for what we had to purchase, and do we have the funds to purchase everything that we need for this upcoming school year? Um, my understanding is that there's 2.5 million uh, approximately uh, in uh, the new adoption of budget line, uh, and there may be additional funds available from um, unused replacement textbook money that uh, schools may not have uh, used. Uh, and so that money will also, uh, could also be put towards the new adoption. So um, the reason we really don't <coughs> know yet how far we can get through this is mm -hmm. that um, there, after you've formally adopted the textbooks at your business meeting, uh, then uh, contract negotiations will start with the textbook publishers. And some publishers are offering discounts based on the number of titles that, that you've adopted, and so we really can't uh, narrow down the, the price specifically at, at this point. And then uh, there has to be uh, enrollment numbers need to be looked at for next school year and grade levels and, and uh, course requests at the secondary level to see the number of students going into those classes. Uh, and so all that will have to be worked on over the next couple months to, to see how far we'll get. Okay. So we'll know at some point in the summertime if, for example, an entire grade level is not going to be getting a textbook. I'm just saying. We, we, we wouldn't divide it by okay. only certain schools got a grade level. No. We, as we said, we're looking to be able to accomplish K-5 and advanced placement at a minimum in this first two and a half million. 
No, but we, we wouldn't divide the city by grade levels and not have them. It's all or none at a particular course or grade level. Thank you. I am finished. Thank you. So as a follow-up to that related to the budget then, if we don't do middle school or high school and yet we're asking them to test on it and or test on eight, are the children at a disadvantage as well because they're not getting? No, because the, the textbook doesn't drive the instruction. The textbook doesn't uh, dictate what, uh, what the topics we're covering. The curriculum uh, does that. And so teachers will be uh, uh, planning their lessons, delivering instruction based on the curriculum. And the textbook will support that, uh, you know, however the teacher chooses to do that. But the curriculum will be aligned and will include uh, whatever is going to be tested. Because yeah. I guess our overall concern is that there is alignment. Because in years past, in other areas, there hasn't necessarily been alignment. And so we don't want to be misaligned just because of a budget right. and or oddities at the state level that That's right. fall down to us. And because the instruction begins with the standards, the state framework for the curriculum, and our strong written curriculum, it's those three pieces will make sure that we don't have gaps in, in the instruction and how do we support what's going on. As, as Mr. Brady was saying, some of the 2008 standards are what the assessments are driven by. And so those are resources that we already have on board. Mm -hmm. Lessons for those things are things we can continue to enhance and, and become proficient in. It's the realignment and, and um, context that moves from grade level to grade level or something new that's introduced is what we have to strengthen through this, so. And then a non-budget related and last question. Do we feel like these textbooks have enough of a technology component given where the state and the nation and the world's going with using technology more for teaching than hard paper pen? Yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, different components with, with the textbooks uh, and, and with the, the technology. Um, some of the companies, the technology allows for uh, the students to be uh, working, uh, back a couple of the AP courses, uh, the students can be working prior to September. Um, uh, they have a prep program online. A lot of the publishing companies have an assessment <coughs> piece um, there, there's technology where um, you know you can have the textbook and you can uh, you know, the student can use the device to scan the, mm -hmm. the little code and right. and it takes them right to a, a video to watch or a document. Uh, so there's there's a lot of enhancements uh, that I think are going to add a lot to to what the teacher can do. Uh, and, and different uh, means of, of instruction in delivering that content. It's really going to give them uh, options and a lot of variety, uh, which is why the PD is so important, to make sure that, that the teachers are utilizing those resources and all the capabilities that, that come with, with the textbook. Yeah. Ms. Bassine? Um, <clears throat> so just in regard to the technology piece, I think we're going to have uh, approaching this point where it's a fine balance, you know, because yes. the technology should not replace the teacher or the textbook because as we, you know, research is also finding, you know, yes, it provides flexibility and options in terms of what you present, but for the child itself, the use of technology can have negative implications as well. So in learning and retaining information and, and such and such. Um, but my question is, you know, I had similar questions around the funding um, and how that will Im impact our textbook adoptions. But I just want to be clear, um, you mentioned course sequencing will, uh, and course availability. The textbooks, the teacher and the availability and the desires of students drive the course not the textbook, the availability of textbooks will not drive. That, that's correct. Right. What okay. Mr. Brady was referencing is once we've looked at the spring course enrollments, the course selections, then we have a projection of how many textbooks we need to purchase in this initial year based on projected enrollments. Okay. So the enrollment in the course is driving what, we're, what we purchase and, and how much we purchase. Okay. And I believe, uh, I think it's 10% is added 
to that order just to cover any you know, fluctuations that, that might occur uh, before September rolls around. Yeah. Whatever he would. My questions were asked. Okay. Already. All right. Anyone else have any uh, questions for Mr. Brady at this time? All right. Okay. Thank, right. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, anything else that, that covered both the yeah. adoption and the materials recommendation, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Will so we vote on this next at our next meeting? At a business meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next up, our school board policy review. So, um, school board policy committee has met, and there's a series of policies that are being recommended to the board for. Um, consideration and uh, discussion I'm going to look at dr. Burson because I know we got a we have a number of team members that are supporting this depending on which policy we're discussing yeah. so. forgive me for a moment I, I did forget one question I had on the textbook you stay there on the textbook because I can just ask you dr. Boone in terms of um, uh, part of the review for uh, inclusion cultural competency diversity uh, can you just speak to how the committee looked at those, those areas? I want to go back to the PowerPoint because in the rating scales that uh, Mr. Brady referenced, let me go to the slide that I saw. They talk about uh, in the process. <coughs> so they support the essential skills and knowledge. And some of that also, oh, Mr. Brady hadn't left. Okay. I was just, I'm sorry. I, I had one, one final question. <laughs> Can you just describe how the committee looked at uh, cultural competency, diversity, and inclusion as part of the textbook selection and adoption process? Yeah, that was a part of the uh, evaluation form. Okay. Uh, they had to look to, to make sure that, yeah, that the textbooks were inclusive, uh, dealt with uh, all segments of our society uh, to they had to determine if there was any uh, bias at all and so yes that was a part of the um, evaluation of the actual textbook for that other 50 percent um, uh, after the first 50 percent was the, the alignment to the standards slide nine that was yeah that was specifically okay. uh, a part of it yes right. thank you yes. yeah. And I apologize for. Oh, that's okay. Back it up on that. Welcome back, Dr. Burson. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, Dr. Gabriel, members of the board, Dr. Boone, good afternoon. The school board policy review committee and the administration have been working to provide to you revised policies based upon the recommendations of the BSBA, as well as recommendations from you as a school board. You have been provided updates for the revised policies for review on board docs. With the exception of the wellness, suicide prevention, and postvention and tobacco-free schools policies, the policies have been revised due to the upcoming or the updating of cross-references, amendments to the Code of Virginia, the updating of policy and legal references to reflect revisions to the regulations of the Virginia Board of Education and the Code of Virginia and the adoption of federal regulations. This is one, there is one new policy that has been brought to your attention for review as well, and that is policy CBCA, the disclosure statement required of the superintendent. So as part of the school division's process to bring potential policy revisions or new policies to your attention, we identify and assign content area experts to lead discussions with the district's leadership team and with the board related to yeah, specific yes. topics. Mm -hmm. This evening, Dr. Lands will be leading our discussion regarding the wellness and suicide prevention and postvention policies. <laughs> In addition, she will provide information to you relative to the collaborative efforts of the school division's administration and members of the Student Health Advisory Committee who work together to develop the drafts that are brought be, or that were provided to you for your review this afternoon. So I'm going to ask Dr. Lands to please come forward.
Good afternoon, Mr. Jordan, Dr. Gabriel, members of the board, Dr. Boone. Um, as Dr. Birdsong mentioned, there are several policies that um, we will be sharing with you this afternoon. Um, I'd like to point out that, um, as was mentioned, other members uh, from the Student Health Advisory Committee um, are present. In addition to Dr. Gabriel and Mrs. Bassine, we also have Ms. Helen Phillips, um, who was the um, chairperson for the wellness policy, um, who's our senior director of school nutrition, along with Mr. Derek Person, um, who was the chairperson for the recess policy, but he's here also as part of the wellness and the other policies that we're discussing um, as the senior coordinator for health and physical education, along with Dr. Dennis Moore, who is the um, chairperson for our subcommittee from the Student Health Advisory Committee for our suicide prevention policy. And so um, they're here and we're all here to um, answer any questions or discuss information with you related to these policies. And I believe we're starting with um, the wellness policy. And I'd like to point out that um, in the work that the um, Student Health Advisory Committee did related to the wellness policy, and as you probably noticed in your review, there was lots of research and um, plenty of discussions and meetings about information in the policy, but that our um, committee and subcommittees uh, utilized the format and followed the template, basically, that is being um, recommended and utilized by the U.S. Department of Agriculture related to this. Um, I also wanted to point out that we have, for this particular policy, a requirement to have um, a wellness policy approved by June 30th of 2017, and so you are aware of the um, timeline for this particular policy that we'll be discussing. Um, one other thing I will point out is that um, you are aware of the public comment period that's related to this particular policy that begins tomorrow and that will run um, through June 21st, I believe, um, which is the date, the expected date of our um, next business meeting where um, we will have approval, um, if appropriate, for this particular policy. And we can begin if there are any specific questions related to certain parts of it, and I'm happy to point out some of the um, areas if we, depends on how you want to move through the first one. I didn't know if there are any comments from um, the <coughs> committee members who want to consider, but we thinking in efficient use of time is what are the questions that the board may have relative, relative to all of these policies rather than just overviewing each one because there's so many. Ms. Doyle. I had a question related to the suicide prevention one. So if anybody, does anybody have any questions on the previous two? Well, I'm on, I have questions on wellness, so. Okay. okay. Me too. Can I, can I make a clarifying statement regarding the wellness policy real quick? Mm -hmm. So within the wellness policy, um, you're going to see some uh, discussion about recess. There is a separate recess policy that <coughs> will come to the board um, at a later time. It's still being worked out. So you're going to see recess in two separate places. So I just wanted to make you all aware of that. Okay, so I have a logistical question then. So in terms of, Dr. Lenz, you were saying there's a public comment period, and that is required by the state, or is that based upon our process? Um, it's part of our process as well. I mean, we, we knew the importance of um, this policy and um, there have been a lot of details and there are a lot of um, there's a lot of information related to it so it was one of the things that we felt um, would be very important to do in terms of all of the new components that we'd be added as well as a requirement um, that's expected um, by our June 30th date that I mentioned in terms of the approval and so we um, Ms. Bassine. Yes, and, and it is strongly recommended. You know, I, I attended a month ago the a wellness policy training, and it's strongly re recommended that uh, the community weigh in on the policy. And it's also recommended, you know, according to the CDC coordinated framework for health, is at that a, uh, a period uh, for public comment be available. So, but it is not required. All right, so process wise, then, so we're, we'll. We're discussing this at the work session. We may have some thoughts back to the policy. The policy as is drafted today will be out for public comment. Yes, sir. So at what point, this, explain the integration process of feedback from the board, feedback uh, from the public, uh, potential re-review of the policy based upon that feedback, and then 
and then adoption. Um, as we've done in the past with other policies, after we receive the feedback that you have tonight, um, we will take that into consideration and review that. There will also be opportunities for us to um, discuss today's feedback at upcoming district leadership team meetings. Um, the information that is uh, received by the district related to the public comment period will be shared with um, members of the um, subcommittees for depending on the um, detail of the policy and I will follow up with um, those particular committee members to discuss that feedback um, we also plan to have another um, either another student health advisory committee meeting or um, as appropriate these subcommittee meetings to take those particular comments <coughs> into consideration and so it's my understanding that the information will continue to come in over the next um, few weeks and um, we will take each piece of information into consideration based on whether or not there's certain things that we need to consider in terms of action items or whether or not they are just things in terms of you know tweaking or or adding pieces so um, it will also um, be shared if appropriate if we learn that we need to have this conversation again during the June um, the actual June work session that would be a couple of weeks before the actual adoption date um, so June then 30. we would have input back by the June 7th work session for adoption by the June 21st business meeting yes sir that's okay. the plan mm -hmm. All right. uh, dr. Robinson my comment on the on the wellness um, policy is is it's, it's a good start um, it's probably the most important policy that we can put forward as a, as a division because uh, chronic disease is, is lifestyle um, driven. Food choices, uh, activity level choices, things of that nature, more than we ever imagined. And uh, this policy starts touching on that. Unfortunately, from from my reading through that, the, the, the recommendations are based on information from 30 years ago. Say that, say that part again? The recommendations for the food choices are based upon information from about 30 years ago. This is what I was taught when I was in chiropractic school. Uh, there's new information about inflammation and sugar and, and uh, 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 too many carbohydrates. The low-fat diet has caused the obesity problem and crisis in this country. You don't get fat by eating fat. You get fat by eating too much sugar that turns to fat. And based upon the recommendations of this policy, it, it doesn't address that. And uh, it's of concern to me, but again, I think it's a good start. Let me comment a little bit on, on the food piece. Obviously, we have some criteria and guidelines to follow. Um, from, from the federal government as it mm -hmm. relates to nutrition, unfortunately. Um, and Helen That's half the problem. And I sh share, share the thought on this that the shift away from some of what was going on in terms of uh, school nutrition, um, only requiring now, 50, I think, of roughly 50% of the grains having to be whole grain. Uh, moving away from fat-free flavored milk to 1% and increasing the sodium content in food is the very wrong direction to go. Mm -hmm. um, and Ms. Phillips and I have talked about, you know, what's working for us and what we'll stay the course on. So I think some of what you see here is driven by the, the food nutrition guidelines that are a minimum standard for us. We certainly have the opportunity to always go above and beyond, but we also have to remember um, when, when we deal with our, our food access and some of the federal commodities that we, we purchase and everything for um, because of the, the amount of free and reduced lunch subsidy we receive, we have to work within some of those too. But I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. I mean, there are those who would say, okay, well, you don't look like the most healthiest, the healthiest person in the world. but this is 55 pounds lighter than what it used to be because of lifestyle changes. And we also know that the infusion of fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, and there's research that says there's a lot of waste. That research is not bearing uh, long-term sustainability and its accuracy. We know and we see the students uh, take advantage of the fresh fruits and vegetables and the opportunity to try new things. 
I rode the blender bike last month, <laughs> and uh, and Mr. Jordan rode it too. He blended a, a, a smoothie, and one of the things that that activity uh, accomplishes for students is one, learning more about healthier op options, fresh fruits and vegetables, trying new things that they may not have normally tasted. And when they get a chance to go home and tell their parents what they tried, it could perhaps become a staple in their home for others to try. And that's the way in which you break the cycle of, of behavior that, that leads to, to very challenging places. The other thing that I think is where a community conversation has to continue, and I know that as a, as a city we're engaged in our uh, community assessment for our health, is how many food deserts do we have in this city? How many places where we have uh, a, any, every fast food outlet that's available to it in the community but no, no grocery store? And whatever is there may be a small local market that is doing its best to provide fresh fruits and vegetables, but certainly can at the volume of some uh, larger mm -hmm. food entities. And that's where I think we have an opportunity and a responsibility to take this policy into the community to ask how do you help us with the wellness because while we serve probably two meals a day to most of our students, what happens when they are out of school and how do we continue to have that conversation? So I see this as a great place when we talk about um, topics for joint meetings with the, with the city council. This is the type of topic that we take there because there are decisions that they are allowing that impacts what happens in homes also. I agree. Ms. Wagner? Um, for us to stay the course in terms of nutrition, <coughs> in terms of budget and the federal government, has that changed? Because they have... Um, looking, looking for Ms. Phillips. Right now, I'm not so sure. She's coming forward. Let, let me share what I know in my limited knowledge, is that it's up to a school district. We have to meet the minimum. Uh -huh. We can always exceed, but we can't go below. Come on, Ms. Phillips. Yes, that's correct. And as always, Dr. Boone, I absolutely love your comments um, about school nutrition because you're such a strong supporter of us, as many members of the school board are. Um, at this point, there is no um, negative impact on our budget. Mm -hmm. We are charged with, from the federal level, being a financially independent entity within a school district. That is the expectation. We are able to maintain that here in Norfolk Public Schools. There are other school nutrition programs throughout Virginia and throughout the country that are not able to be financially self-sustaining. However, we are. And part of that is because of our high percentage of free and reduced that we have here in Norfolk. We get a greater reimbursement for a free meal than we do for a reduced price or a full price meal. So that kind of helps us on our financial bottom line. But um, we implemented the standards ahead of the requirement in 2012. Um, we were absolutely stay in the course, even though the Secretary of Agriculture um, has allowed some flexibilities. We will not be doing those here in Norfolk. We are going to stick with mm -hmm. what is working for our children, and we are not rolling those back. And we have had that conversation a couple of times, mm -hmm. Dr. Boone and I, that we are definitely mm -hmm. sticking with what we have. Our kids are happy. So I hope that answered your question. It did. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I may just follow up. Mm -hmm. I've never questioned um, the, 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 I don't want to say integrity. You guys do a great job. You guys do a wonderful job. I and I and you are leaders in the in the uh, in the profession. And I, I want to thank you for that. I just want to make sure that we um, maintain our standards, mm -hmm. at, at, at at exceed and 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 look at in how the the research is changing and and finding out what what are the best things that we want to do is teach our our children how to eat and and ultimately their families too. Yes, the intent of the. Um Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 was that the nutrition standards would be revised with every new um, addition of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Unfortunately, as our um, administration change happened on the federal level, this is not likely to happen. Right. It's not likely that the nutrition standards will continue to be updated to meet current science and current practice. Um, and your comment about what we do in school and being taken home and creating healthy families, we absolutely see that. I see that among my staff and the people who work within school nutrition that um, what we do at school, it does go home Good. and they do influence their families and we are making an impact. Excellent. Thank you. Ms. Bassine. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to highlight a couple points. Dr. Boone touched on it in, in terms of our involvement with, we, we are actually 
there are certain um, members of NPS, including Ms. Phillips, um, who are taking part in the Norfolk Department of Public Health's um, community, community health planning process. And, um, you know, they're addressing chronic disease prevention, uh, safety, safer communities, and um, sexual health is, is a, the other top priority area. <coughs> but we've been involved in that as an asset, you know, and we're working right now, they're in the process of coming up with action plans around this where schools are, are one of the key assets. And so we're kind of developing this together. So this is a great opportunity uh, to be joining forces. We have members from city council, um, and and it seems like every entity you can think of in the community. So so it's been a really great process. Um, so we are, I think we are right in the center of it. Um, some of the key highlights in this is that uh, you know we are we talk about gardens, school gardens, and so you know you talk about parents and children learning where food comes from and making that connection, which is important in terms of exposing uh, children to that. So. So that's also another. But the other key piece I wanted to also um, to tag on is that we have included in here doing a school health index, which will also give schools the opportunity to evaluate where they are in the health of their schools and students so that we can better develop programs and, and, if we, and enhance our policies you know, down the road. So that's something that's different that we're doing to try to be more um, I guess at the forefront and proactive about what we're doing for the health of our students and staff. So that's the, that's the other key piece here is that we are also addressing staff in this policy. Other questions? So I may end up <coughs> just sending you some things line by line as part of the public comment period, but I had a couple of questions, maybe concerns. So in the policy, it references um, a uh, school improvement plan um, somehow tying the that the wellness policy or implementation plan somewhere it mentioned would be tied to a school improvement plan there's a federal requirement that um, we're able to assess it and that we have a means of oh, ensuring yes. that the wellness policy is implemented and being followed in every school and so as a Subcommittee that writing this for Norfolk, that was our way of doing it, was tying it to, I think it was, I don't know the name of the report, um, but it is that the executive directors on a principal level would be able to ensure that that's happening in their school. That's the school health index. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's the last bullet right. on, on the um, <coughs> mark, marked up copy. Yeah, the idea is that we don't say we have a wellness policy and then we never use it to drive the conversation. So, you, you know, how will we be able to, to document and make sure that uh, healthy living and lifestyles are uh, part of what we focus on? And so there are a lot of ways to do that. It can come, it comes through our curriculum. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to do a new report or a, a new implementation, but some, Areas that are in the accountability plan will certainly get us there. What do we know about uh, physical fitness participation? What do we know about um, uh, all, all of those aspects? What's in our health curriculum? What's in some of the science that gets to that? So yeah, I guess I was just seeking clarity. So in, in the policy where it references the district school improvement plan, what which plan or what plan is that I think referencing? They is that reference, a strategic it, plan? Is I that, think it would, well, I mean, so I'm it's, it's, it's a legitimate question. Okay. Um, that I, I think I heard Ms. Phillips say they gave it a term to meet the standard, but I, I think it's more closely aligned to what was in the, what has been in the strategic plan and how do we address individual school planning, you know, and our longer term goal to have returned to a comprehensive accountability system where the planning annually is for schools, there will be a place for this. But it's whatever, it, it pretty much references whatever the district is doing. And so we could make sure that, again, we could do a, a cross-reference review with the board's accountability plan to ensure that we have aspects of, of the expectations of this policy as part of our data review. Yeah, I just want to make sure that there's clarity because the policy will survive all of us. And we use, different, we use all this different language 
And so I wasn't even clear on which plan that was. And so maybe some clarification around that would be helpful. Yes. Um, the other piece, uh, in reference to the school uh, wellness committee. So there was uh, a reference to a school wellness committee, at least I think I read it right, it was a wellness committee that was a subcommittee of the shack. Then there was also a, every school would have a wellness champion. So as the wellness champion, do we have 45 individuals who then serve on this subcommittee, or is that something separate at a school level? I couldn't quite. Yeah, the wellness champion would be separate at the school level. It was the um, subcommittee is the group of us who wrote this policy that would include each school having a wellness champion to sort of be the one that um, helps that particular school meet these goals and come up with other wellness activities for their school. So each school will have a committee and the wellness champion kind of it's makes up or <laughs> kind of structures that committee. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the shack has a subcommittee that is proposed to uh, monitor the implementation plan. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, the overall. Well, the no. The subcommittee was formed to create the wellness policy. We haven't really gone beyond creating the policy as far as what the roles of the subcommittees or if we were even going to have subcommittees. I think what we wanted to do was just give each policy a good amount of attention um, with a variety of voices um, in order to do that. So the champion and the subcommittee are two separate entities. The shack is what is ultimately going to be responsible for getting the feedback from the schools and then pushing out any recommendations to the board regarding the wellness policy. Okay. So just a general comment there. I think the responsibility for uh, monitoring implementation of policy belongs with the school board. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the any subcommittees would make recommendations to the school board, but I think that's a school board responsibility. Wouldn't it be through SHAC, though? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't SHAC make the responsibilities to the school board? That's what I'm saying. Okay. What, You're right. Not, not the, the subcommittee. subcommittee. Well, whatever it is, the, yeah. the, the, way I, the, the way I was reading the policy, it looked like the responsibility for the policy, for the was, policy with was with SHAC or a subcommittee of SHAC and not with the board. Okay. And I, 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 yeah, I would think that it is, it, it's a role of that committee to make recommendations to the board relative to the policy. Only recommendations. And in the... Um, recommendations for changes or enhancements. I think that would be the way it would flow. Another. Can I just help oh. for the viewing public just to help them understand, SHAC is Student Ooh, Health, Health Advisory, Advisory Committee. 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 Yes. So I know we're using our lingo, but I think it's important for the community to know yes. the full committee. Sure. And uh, the other two comments I had was the policy was uh, very descriptive and in some cases prescriptive, and I just want to make sure that the policy committee look at what's what's policy and what's regulation because mm -hmm. like there was a lot of stuff in there that was very in one, in one sense it said the superintendent had a responsibility for regulations and implementation but then it kind of spelled out almost the uh, regulations every, and right, implementation. There, every, in there so just just consider consideration for that and then um, whether or not there are any human and financial resource requirements for the implementation, whether or not it's anything new. Uh, like, you know, with what the policy describes, do we have all the staffing and support within our existing human infrastructure and financial resources to <coughs> carry out, or is this policy uh, envisioning that there would be additional staffing and resources? So just to get a, maybe like an impact statement um, uh, for, for that as well. So those are my, my thoughts. I mean, I thought it was a, you know, very good work. Some of y'all worked hard on it. Anything else on the wellness policy? We, we left the part out about removing the candy dishes from the boardroom. What is you? We left the part out about removing these. <laughs> Presence doesn't mean you have to partake. That's right. In moderation. That's right. Everything is it. It's what, after what? school hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else on the Full wellness power. wellness policy? <laughs> yeah, that's what they don't have to partake. Right. Right. Um, right. Oh, okay. um, you know, and I, I just I, the one thing I did notice was just in the title because we do address staff wellness. Mm -hmm. um, I would just uh, I think we should add this, this uh, 
Hold on, let me get back up to the top. All right. Um, it should be school, school wellness. Is... Just call it school wellness versus student wellness since we do address staff. Good point. I think it's one last thing since Dr. Gabriel brought it up about the <coughs> recess being in this policy and a separate policy coming forward. I mean, I'm not sure I understand what the why we would have it in two places. So at some point, maybe if you all can just give us some I, some understanding as to why. And, we, and, why and, that let, is. and let me add my input on okay. in terms of what we're asking for. I, I, I have a similar question. I was hoping that recess would be a set of guidelines versus another policy because if the policy says we will have recess, then the companion piece should, could either be guidelines or regulation versus a separate and standalone recess policy. So, um, because I think again, it gets <laughs> ironically to, to what Mr. Jordan was saying about <coughs> this is what we're going to do. Superintendent has to promulgate, but this is what it's going to look like. And so something for consideration as, as you're working on the recess piece, um, given the fact that there's a strong statement relative to recess in the wellness policy, are there associated guidelines then around uh, implementing recess that could be the consideration of the board to accompany the policy rather than a separate policy? And I don't know uh, what those discussions have been and if it's a requirement for a separate recess policy. But if it's here, then how do we take it to the next place? And so what does it look like can be defined, you know, I don't know if we need one or two sentences in this policy to define it, but then reference perhaps the guidelines for recess or whatever yeah, else. Just, so just note rec recess is mentioned quite a bit in there, quite a lot of terminology there, so you just may want to take another, yeah. another look at that. Ms. Doyle, you had some on some other policies? Yes. So if we look at JHH, suicide prevention, I think the policy reads very well. I commend the group on putting this together so comprehensively. The one thing I noticed was if you look down on page seven of eight, in the red line oh, okay mm -hmm. sorry page seven of eight of red line mm -hmm. Roman, uh, numer <coughs> Roman numeral seven suicide prevention resources I think there are a few more that we may want to add mm -hmm. because it appears to me that you've listed two of the hospitals that are in Norfolk but probably with the intent was to list all three and that would include Sentara Lee Hospital which is on Kempsville Road uh, in Norfolk as well and then if we could just update the name of Sentara Norfolk General Hospital as well. <coughs> so as I read it again, it appeared that you were listing those resources that are in the boundaries of the city. So I would encourage us to add another hospital that also is in the city, which is Sentara Lee, and then just to correct the name of Sentara Norfolk General Hospital. And hadn't thought about it till you just mentioned that, Ms. Doyle. Um, what about the Norfolk Community Services Boards? Because yeah. they well, also, they point. too well, have. Right. A prevention and well and and this is where we also there there are a number of other um, suicide prevention um, organizations as well so I think it opens up you know yes it does. Um, which ones we include which ones you know right, the, right. Vetting, and, the vetting of those organizations right. and and, um, and I, I think you hit on a key term in that Miss Bassine when you say organizations versus entities who's right. more of the, the public. So we know the expectation of hospitals and how you right. get there right. rather than um, perhaps private organizations that we don't have any clear knowledge of and can't necessarily right. see their success and, and their accountability ratings around some of this. So. Yeah, I guess on that note, I mean, should the resources be listed in the policy or could there be a reference to uh, mm -hmm. to a list to a reference to a list of resources that can be constantly yeah. updated otherwise every time there's that a that the counselors have you know that's the other thing or and that we have somewhere else, right I'm just saying but, but if you if we list it this way every time it's address change phone number change yeah. name change yeah. do we have to we come have to back and, it. and update yeah. the policy versus a I reference I think that's a great recommendation mm -hmm. yeah um, it, 
Ms. Bassine? I actually, despite the fact that I've read this a couple of times, I, in looking at it again and comparing it against uh, even the model policy, mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of questions for Dr. Boone or, and team. Um, the suicide prevention counselors, do we currently have suicide prevention counselors or is this piece something that we are aspiring to That's an impact it. statement. Impact <laughs> statement, okay. Yes. And, and, and some of that is also what, what specialized training that we do for existing staff. It doesn't necessarily represent that we have to have new staff, but what's the intensive level of training that we include for current staff to, to allow them to fulfill that role if needed. All right, so that's an impact statement. Um, and uh, the other piece is, you know, we talk about uh, the training responsibilities of teachers and staff, but we don't describe here what kind of training and PD they're they're going to receive. So I think, I think we, I think that's an important piece that um, we need to incorporate okay. in, into this policy because um, we need to include staff professional development and training. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're also dealing with the tobacco policy too now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So uh, <coughs> with the tobacco policy, I just, uh, you know, we've been having conversations around um, enforcement of policies that can have an impact or unintentional consequence with um, uh, suspensions. So as I was reading the policy, um, I get, my general question is, is anything in this policy that may unintentionally through enforcement uh, uh, cause us to have to deal with uh, issues around suspensions almost similar to what some of the discussions we've had like with the cell phone policy. So has there been any type of assessment or analysis as to who's going to be enforcing this policy? Does it, you know, are we putting this burden on uh, school resource officers and are we um, in our manner in which we go about trying to enforce it, could we have uh, unintended consequence of well, and this policy is not just for students, yeah, I right? Know, this is also for staff. Yeah, I'm just dealing with so, students right now. Right, right. Well, but, uh, but the response for, for, to your question is the same. <laughs> right. um, how do we deal with it? Obviously, it would be reflected in our code of student conduct and the expectations around that. So we already have no smoking and no right. tobacco products there. Right. We shouldn't necessarily see an uptick, I'm thinking, on the student piece. The biggest challenge is, is going to be around how we navigate any expectations for staff. Mm -hmm. and that one I have a question about. Right, but if I'm, so first of all, let me be clear, I'm all for a tobacco-free environment. Yes. Uh, but, <laughs> but I just want to make sure, you know, however the, the existing policy may be in this new policy is, um, I just know from and children you. Yes, that, you know, oftentimes they will I mean, we, we're pretty specific in here about certain things. Mm -hmm. So there are, uh, you know, cigar products that uh, students like to carry around. So someone has it in the book bag or whatever. I just want to, I just want to put out there in terms of how we go about implementing the enforcement piece of this policy that we also consider the discussions that we've had around suspensions and all the other things that we've, that we've, that we've talked about. So. Yes, sir. And we did talk about that some, and um, I would agree with what Dr. Boone mentioned in that it's, we currently address this in our student handbook and um, don't allow these products anyway, and so we address them. They're addressed in the handbook. They're addressed in our rule and law violations. They're addressed in the state codes related to um, inappropriate personal <coughs> property and law violations related to these things, so we don't anticipate um, an increase in these types of things, and staff members would deal with them whether currently we have, um, you know, cases where things are found in random searches. Currently we have things where, you know, in a variety of different instances where students may be addressed related to 
tobacco products and other things listed here. And so um, we have discussed it, but we don't see um, any particular, um, you know, potential for increase in terms of um, staff and related to this particular policy, we don't at this point. Um, I do understand what you're saying related to the cell phones as we've had conversations about that, but um, this is a, an existing piece in there that just um, adds a little more in terms of, as we said, about the staff and the visitors. And um, um, Right. I think well, yeah, Like I say, students, I don't, we don't anticipate any, because we already have this prohibition and as we've updated our code of student conduct annually and what are the list of restricted items, mm -hmm. we've included electronic cigarettes and some of those things in there. Yeah, it's, it's more of uh, um, the attention I do. and the focus that we bring to it. I mean, <coughs> Cell phones get dealt with because oftentimes folks will consider them a distraction and they see them. Right. Uh, but I just, it was just a question. It's just something for, for consideration. Mm -hmm. Ms. Wagner. Question, personnel. <clears throat> um, building for parameters, facility parameters in terms of smoking personnel. Because there, I've seen uh, individuals that will go in their car and smoke and yeah. come back yeah. in the building. Yeah. So yeah, they said that's, that's a prohibition. That's, that's yeah. part of yeah. it that they, are not to do that. They're not to do that, okay. Amen. And then uh, the other question I had um, on the, the outdoor piece was, um, I guess not, not an area of focus, but something for consideration as to whether or not we wanted to include uh, bleacher areas outdoors as okay. if we were to include anything. Uh, okay. As far as the policy is concerned, so we'll be, are okay. we? But wouldn't those be grounds? Right. Yeah. That's school what I think. grounds. Ground, school grounds, and so very similar to hospitals that have said declared this is a, a tobacco-free, smoke-free zone. Campus. Mm -hmm. Campus. Right. Yeah. That's the term, and oh, so campus. that that if that's what we're is that what you're asking about, I Mr. George? Well, I'm a, I just thought as I read the <coughs> policy, it said that. Um, School property means mm -hmm. in any property surrounding building structures, athletic grounds, parking lots, or any other outdoor property owned, lease or contracted by the school division, both on and off site. But then I thought I saw somewhere else in the policy where it seemed as though the the outside area was not given that level of focus. So maybe it's a moot uh, issue. Maybe I just read it wrong. So yeah, certainly we will. If adopted, we'll need to do some different signage. Yeah, mm -hmm. in yeah. our our buildings, right. and it's going to be interesting for this building because this is technically a city-owned building, mm -hmm. and they have they allow a smoking area, which is technically on the campus of the building. You know, it's on the city hall side of the building. And so, we, yeah, we talked about that. It's our policy, and um, over time we've addressed different things related to like the signs that we had put downstairs that direct people out towards the back of the building, towards the road, related to fire marshal um, concerns. And so we have talked about the enforcement of that, and we'll have conversations um, if and when approved with our staff members who um, patrol the parking lots and um, you know, the manner in which we address our visitors and how we um, might advertise um, or enforce or share this with um, staff and others. And my last question was the, the young ladies that came to the school board uh, from Granby to, uh, with their recommendations, have they had an opportunity to review this and does this policy align with what they were asking us to, to do? It, it does align with what they were as or does not it does okay. align with with and they were representing an organization mm -hmm. um, and the recommendations put forth by that organization so this is an alignment with with that which is essentially um, the elements of a comprehensive tobacco free campus so we have addressed that and there's a checklist that we've you know mm -hmm. addressed all those areas so is this also going to be open for public input that's the idea to yes. have all our health related yeah. yeah so i think if we reach back out to them yes and i i we've we've um been in communication and so you i i wasn't sure if we were going to get to it so she knows that today we were working okay. on it and we'll be open okay. to it anything else comments thoughts on any of the other <laughs> policies 
Ms. Ms. Doyle. So I have a question slash comment on KG, community use of school facilities. So it was updated based on a legal reference, but it noted that the policy requires superintendent to write guidelines. However, we do have KGZA, ZB, right. ZBR, and ZC that are regulations and otherwise. Are we updating those two or are they in keeping with the now proposed policy? I'll ask Dr. Birdsong to you want to repeat that? To help us. Please, there. please. So currently we have KGZA, which is community use of school facilities, KGZB, community requirement and slash restrictions, KGZB-R, which is the regulation associated with that, and KGCZ all related to use of community community use of school facilities. Will those need to be changed at all? Because it says here the policy requires soup to write guidelines. It appears we already have some mm -hmm. in right. place. Okay, I don't know, not at this time. Okay, so I guess we just need to note yeah. that those four are in place and acceptable and correlate with the current. Absolutely. <coughs> okay. Because I think those who have been discussed, vetted, Reviewed, oh, yeah. debated, right. yeah. and, time, and the guidelines, of course, really posted on our website also. So, uh, community members who want to lease our facilities, exactly. right? Make sure people are using the right form. That's all we That's need. right. <laughs> We've made that correction. <laughs> uh, last additional question I had on the the equity task force um, that was added as a uh, board advisory committee. What was the thought behind that? Because I, not that it not that it is not, mm -hmm. but the when we went through the whole writing of the equity task force and we had given certain uh, ownership to the superintendent, okay. and now we're so I guess I'm just asking generally now are we saying that if we have a task force mm -hmm. that we're going to treat task forces as advisory committees to the board I guess that's what I'm really asking. So during our last meeting that was that information we discussed that and so it was our impression that you wanted us to include this in the yeah, policy that's so thought. that's why we, we went back and did that oh, yes I, that. I think you recommended it oh, maybe um, I did I don't know. a few months ago oh, it's been so, so we, long <clears throat> yeah we were okay. addressing that okay are you good or I should we go back and I'll revise? go back and I'll go back and <laughs> revisit what I said and why I said it and so. if I recall you know if I recall correctly because you know we've had some task force forces that have convened to tackle you know a particular area but because I believe that this task force would re could remain as in an advisory capacity hmm. um, throughout I believe that was one of that was your rationale hmm. for including it Okay. But we can go back and try no, to just, figure out what that is. I was rereading the, the, the change in the equity policy. I just want to make sure that we, in doing that, have not caused misalignment between what the equity policy says in terms of the role of the superintendent and all that multitude of stuff we wrote around advisory committees. I just don't want to complicate the, the equity task force piece. My thinking of your question is, is it redundant, is, is my thought. Because if the <coughs> membership, the term and all of that, <coughs> terms are, are outlined in the equity task force, do, you, do we need it both places? Right. Um, so for me, I can see that as a, as a redundancy issue versus um, skewing, you know, because obviously you follow the policy, but then if you put it here, then you got to address two. You either would be replicating exactly what we have around <coughs> membership and terms and, and how right. folks are appointing in this policy, but it shouldn't be any different from what's in the equity if it right. goes in two places. Yes, yeah. I'll, I'll look at it. <coughs> okay. okay. It, you brought my attention to it, so. Okay. okay. All right. Anything else on uh, <coughs> policies or? So th there was one other area that we okay. probably need to discuss today. As you know, on February the 15th, we adopted the family engagement policy. And during that discussion, Dr. Um, Robinson uh, expressed some concerns that um, perhaps there were not specific expectations outlined in that policy. And the board asked us to go back and look at some school parent compacts. And so we did, we did just that. So um, for your review, we did provide you an example or a sample copy of a school parent compact on board docs. And so we wanted to give you an opportunity this afternoon 
to provide some direction to the administration regarding in what direction you want to go. Again, this is a model or a sample copy, and um, we, didn't, we did spend some time with it, but we didn't want to get ahead of ourselves in the event that you decided that this was not the direction you wanted to go. But we did model this after um, a parent compact provided by the Virginia School Board, or I'm sorry, the Board of Education. So are you all comfortable with us just taking some time and right. looking through it and maybe at our uh, June work session we can come back and see if there's some direction we want to do. So we'll, we'll get back to you in June after we <laughs> okay. think through it some more. Okay. Thank you for the work though. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. <clears throat> and so that concludes the policy discussion unless there are additional questions or comments. None for me. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that's the, the meat of our agenda. Um, just a couple updates, and if there's any other updates that the board has or questions from today's meeting that may be lingering. Um, we, we do know that uh, uh, council had some discussions on our uh, uh, proposed budget yesterday at their meeting. They're still scheduled to, um, I believe, adopt a budget um, May 23rd, I believe it is. So we know that we're still going to have to be prepared to uh, come back and um, see what recommendations we receive from the administration once once that gets uh, settled and finalized. But you all are aware of the ongoing discussions that are taking place, administration, administration, and those of us that are also in communication with the with the council. But it seems like we may be in a good place where. Uh, uh, you know, it might be I's dotted and T's crossed versus trying to figure out whole paragraphs. So uh, we'll just be looking to uh, Dr. Boone and her team to provide us with additional guidance as that, uh, as that work continues. Um, we, we had a, uh, I thought we had a very good um, uh, training, school board training. There's some action items that we're uh, working on. I was sharing with uh, Ms. Doyle prior to the meeting that Ms. Banks has worked on uh, um, core work for our ethics and norms and some of the things that we've been talking about. So we know that Ms. Doyle and I have a task of working on that and bringing that back to you. And that, that'll probably end up at our June work session as well. Um, Dr. Boone mentioned we, some of us attended the Tywood Regional Forum. Uh, Dr. Staples spoke and it was a very interesting presentation that he gave. We'll get a copy of it so that everybody can have that. Part of his presentation included a matrix that was evolving from work at the state board that looked very similar to our uh, school board accountability plan. So I, I called Ms. Bassine. I think there are some things that they had in there in terms of color coding that maybe we can look at uh, including in our plan. But it was um, good to see that the state board was catching up with Norfolk's work. <laughs> Um, anything else I may have left off? I mean, we had the uh, Kaboom Playground bill. That was great. We had the uh, teach I call it the Teacher of the Year, but the uh, Evening of Excellence, evening of excellence uh, uh, which was uh, uh, went very well. And Dr. Gabriel is writing that Teacher Appreciation Week. Yes. Uh, so those of you that have not... Uh, deliver good healthy food to uh to a teacher yet then you have plenty of opportunity to to do that i'm sure they will appreciate the yogurt that you provide if that's healthy uh anything else um as action items or items we need to make sure we get ms doyle so i know you have agenda planning tomorrow mm -hmm. could you start populating our calendars for meetings after july 1. yes matter of fact uh Dr. Gabriel and I met this week and we started working on that and then we were going to make sure as our, with our agenda plan that we'll, we'll do that. Right. Uh, we know we still have the, those dates for uh, training July 20, 21st, but we'll, we'll solidify that uh, yeah, tomorrow. Right. tomorrow. Yeah. And then we just get in sequence again and then cycle with hearings and yes. so on? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Anything else in terms of the work of the board? Okay. Dr. Boone, any, any final? We'll be moving into 
SOL testing next week. We started some of, I think, our advanced placement testing and certain things. So um, encourage our, our students and, and, and teachers and others. And if we've done all that we need to do, we'll see the improvement in terms of approaching the core in, uh, curriculum and instruction. So. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Consider the meeting adjourned. Thank you.